so hello everyone um, and welcome to Green Week and to our first event, How to Help Hedgehogs. Um, this event is running as part of Green Week, um, which runs from today to Friday and has been created in collaboration with staff and students from York St. John University and the Students Union. Um, we have a wide range of events coming up this week. Um, so check the YSD events calendar for the most up-to-date list of activities. Um, for today, we are joined by Joe, Joe Wilkinson from the Hedgehog Friendly Campus. Um, Hedgehog Friendly Campus um, is a national biodiversity program for universities funded by the British Hedgehog Preservation Society to promote impactful changes uh, for hedgehogs. York St. John University is also a part of this campaign. And as part of the campaign, we took on initiatives um, such as starting our YSJ Hedgehog Twitter, our Hedgehog blog, um, fundraising, as well as doing some staff litter picks, building hedgehog houses around campus and adding streamer stickers um, to remind users to check the area for hedgehogs before streaming the grass. Um, Joe has really helped and supported us to achieve a bronze accreditation um, back in the uh, beginning of 2020. Um, so it's very nice to invite her to this webinar. Um, I am now going to hand over to Joe, um, who is going to share with us some information about hedgehogs, um, as well as how you can help them when you spot them on campus. Um, we are welcoming questions throughout the event, um, so please add your questions to the Q&A button on your screen at any time, and we will get through as many as we can at the end of the session. Um, just to remind everyone also that this webinar is being recorded. Okay, um, so yes, over to you, Joe. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, and thanks everybody for joining. Happy, happy Go Green Week. Um, it's, a, it's a very apt time to be talking to you about hedgehogs being that hedgehogs are just in the process of waking up from hibernation. So um, it's, a, it's a nice time of year for, for wildlife and for hedgehogs in particular. So yeah, as, as has been said already, I'm Jo and I'm the project manager for Hedgehog Friendly Campus, uh, which is a national campaign hoping to make positive changes for hedgehogs at universities. Um, give us a follow on um, the handle at the bottom of the screen there, it's at Hog Friendly, if you want to find out what's going on at universities across the rest of the UK. And for anybody that's interested in knowing a little bit more about Hedgehog Friendly Campus um, and how uh, you as, as students and staff can get involved, I've got a little video just to kick us off. Um, you mean know, if you can just give me a thumbs up that you can hear it when I press play, that would be grand. Hi everyone, my name is Ryan and I volunteer with Hedgehog Friendly Campus to turn my university campus into a place where it's safe for hedgehogs to thrive and survive. Did you know that wild hedgehog populations in the UK have decreased by up to 50% since the year 2000? This is due to a number of things such as litter, roads, lack of food and lack of water. Hedgehogs really need our help and Hedgehog Friendly Campus is a great way to get involved while you're at university. So no matter what your strengths are, there's definitely something you can do to get involved. For example, you can pick up litter like crisp packets and drink cups that can actually track hedgehogs, hedgehogs are fired to learn if hedgehogs live on your campus, writing blogs to educate people, fundraiser events like bake sales and other sponsored events, and even building houses for hedgehogs to hibernate in through the winter. The best part is you don't even need to know anything about biology or conservation. You don't even need to know anything about hedgehogs. Anyone can get involved. In fact, you're given everything you need to get the ball rolling, such as workshops, fun talks, and training sessions. And if helping these cute animals isn't reason enough, you get to volunteer as and when it's convenient for you. You get things like a certificate and a reference to boost your CV, and you get to work with a species that probably needs you. If this sounds like something interesting to you, please sign up at hedgehogfriendlycampus.co.uk. So the, the eagle eyed of you might have noticed at the end, um, you were directed to a website to register. Um, for the meantime, if you're interested in getting involved at your university, what I would say is probably just to come through through me. So drop me an email because we've actually got some changes going on with the website that mean it, it's not um, available for people to register. For the even more eagle eyed of you that noticed there are free starter packs available. Again, just drop us an email to claim yours and then you can find out a little bit more about how you can get involved in Hedgehog Friendly Campus at your university. Um, so I hope that gives you a little bit of a context about who we are and what we do. 
Um, and I hope that it's piqued your interest in learning a little bit more. And today, really, from, from this point on, is going to be packed full of information about how you as an individual, as a staff member, as a student, can help hedgehogs um, before it's too late. Uh, so it's going to be um, cram packed full of suggestions for you. Um, and unfortunately, the first few slides are a little bit sad. So I'm going to bring you down on a Monday, mo Monday morning, Monday afternoon, before I bring you back up again with some um, helpful tips and solutions. Um, so just to get us started to set the scene, um, as the, the video already mentioned, hedgehogs are in trouble. We've lost up to 50% of native uh, hedgehogs here in the UK since the year 2000. It's around 30% in urban areas, so still not great. And there's an estimated 1 million remaining hedgehogs in the UK. And the threats that hedgehogs face are numerous, often very much interconnected and primarily caused by us as humans. And there's a lot of information out there that's been pulled together to produce this report, the state of Britain's hedgehogs. Um, that was in 2018, so that was almost an unimaginably long time ago now. And there's a new one of these being published this year. But if you do want to give it a read, it's only a couple of pages and you can download it for free at hedgehogstreet.org slash state of. I'll be going through some of the threats and solutions today. Unfortunately, um, in the summer last year, hedgehogs were listed as vulnerable to extinction in Britain. So you can see them in that yellow band in the middle there on the Mammal Society's report from the summer last year. So vulnerable to extinction, taking into account the rate of loss um, that we've seen in hedgehog populations and the trend in um, um, the, the threats that they face not not slowing really so just to put that into context the next step for the hedgehog would be the endangered category so they would be in with the likes of the red squirrel and um, so you know I think that really hammers hammers the point home that hedgehogs hedgehogs are not doing well and we'll talk about why this is a little later on So when we're talking about hedgehogs today, we're talking about the West European hedgehogs. Some images have just popped up on the screen there. I hope you can see they are the nation's favourite mammal. Time and time again, they win. They, they top the charts. They top the poles. We love them um, as, a, as a nation. And uh, that's possibly because they're so characteristic and charismatic. It's also possibly because hedgehogs are quite... Um, interesting as, as a species that they don't have a fight or flight mechanism. So here we've got a photo at the top there of a, of a young child getting nose to nose with a, a, um, a wild a wild hedgehog. Now that one's probably a rehabilitated he hedgehog because it's out in the day. You wouldn't normally see a hedgehog out in the daytime. Um, so that one's obviously just being used for a bit of a promo photo opportunity there, but they are quite an interesting animal in that, in that sense that you can get quite physically close, um, physically close to them. That goes some way to explaining why we love them so much. Um, they're also quite interesting in that they're an indicator species. So if you have hedgehogs on your campus or in your park or in your garden, it's an indicator that that is a good habitat for wildlife in general. There's lots of invertebrates, the soil is good, and um, there's lots of plants and, um, and, and weeds that encourage invertebrates and that sort of thing. So having hedgehogs on your, on your campus, um, it, it would be a really fantastic indicator that something's happened, that you're doing something right on campus to preserve biodiversity. Um, when it comes to um, hedgehogs legal protection, I wonder if there might be some questions on this, so I'll address it now. They do have some legal protections here in the UK. Unfortunately, um, the two main uh, bits of legislation that protect hedgehogs don't go a very long way to protecting um, their habitats. So they're not really fit for purpose to protect hedgehogs further. The government isn't doing enough to help hedgehogs. The two bits of policy that are out there at the moment to protect hedgehogs prevent cruelty or trapping, which is a very low level threat as a on the population level for hedgehogs. And so really what we, what we need um, from this point forward is, is better legislation that addresses the, the root causes of their decline, which I will go into um, in a few slides time. So yeah, we're talking about the West European hedgehog. That's the wild hedgehog that we find here in the UK and all across the West of Europe. And this is what they look like. This is their kind of anatomy, if you will, or their body shape. And you can see the top, there's a, an image from um, a museum specimen, a half specimen. You can see that the skeleton and on the other side you can see the external structure so that the spiky outer outer layer and that their skeleton's quite um uh, not not particularly specialized it looks a lot like lots of other mammal skeletons except they've got quite a short neck and they do have a, a little tail as well and for those of you that have seen hedgehogs in the wild you may not have spotted that 
little tail tucked in behind their spines. They're about 30 centimetres in length on average as a, um, a sort of fully grown adult. So they're quite small. They've got a long nose for sniffing. Um, so they use their keen smell sense to hunt out food in the environment. And they're covered in spines, so white brown spines that really offer protection um, from predators. There's thousands of these spines that run all the way across the, the, from the head down to the base of the tail. They've got a fluffy underbelly, though, um, which is um, uh, is quite... Um, it means they're quite vulnerable on their bellies so what they need to be able to do is curl into a ball if they hear a predator or smell a predator or or are fearful for their lives um, and they can do this using a very clever kind of um pouch of muscle that runs again from about the same same area the brow of the head down to the base of the tail and if they hear a noise they can contract that muscle and it pulls in the soft underbelly and the limbs and the head and keeps them all protected which is quite clever so they've had the same more or less the same anatomy for the last sort of 10 or 15 million years so they're obviously doing something right there we're not talking about this hedgehog today and um, so this is the african pygmy hedgehog a completely different species of hedgehog it's an exotic pet species we don't find them here native um uh, wild in the uk certainly we shouldn't do and conversely the um the west european hedgehog or our wild hedgehog is neither suitable for um for for being a pet and it's also it's also illegal to keep them as pets so try not to get the two confused <laughs> they're adorable the little african pygmy ones but yes a very different type of species altogether much much smaller and much much paler in color <laughs> so back to our uk wild hedgehog um, they've got quite a characteristic diet, which is um, very useful for really everybody, um, everybody to know. Understanding what a hedgehog eats can help us to understand what a hedgehog needs from a habitat. So um, if you have a look down towards the bottom of the screen, you can see that there's three or four types um, of invertebrate that make up the bulk really of a hedgehog's natural diet. So things like beetles, ground beetles, and um, earwigs, caterpillars, and millipedes and earthworms and are really the bulk of, of, a, of a hedgehog's natural diet, foraging diet. So they're spending much of their nights um, snuffling around in the, in the edges of parks and gardens and campuses, hunting out those sorts of food. Um, some of you may have spotted some funny old things on that list there, so eggs. Um, hedgehogs will eat ground nesting birds eggs if they come across them, um, although that doesn't happen all that often. Uh, and they will also eat mammals. They won't attack and kill mammals, but they'll eat dead mammals on the side of the road, so roadkill. So they're actually very opportunistic in the way that they um, feed. And just a quick video to demonstrate that um, of a, a wild hedgehog eating a dead rabbit on the side of the road. So a bit grisly, a bit gruesome, but quite interesting. Very tiny little rabbit eating a, a tiny little hedgehog eating a, um, a giant rabbit. So yeah, they are very much opportunistic feeders. Quick fun fact, in suburban and urban environments, supplementary food from, um, uh, from people also forms quite a significant part of their diet and can help them um, to build up fat reserves ready for things like hibernation, um, which I'll go into a bit more detail about in the next uh, couple of slides. So um, supplementary food from people uh, is, is really pet food. So most people that feed hedgehogs in their garden are feeding cat biscuits. Um, or uh, wet cat food or dog food. Um, so that's really the only thing we can recommend that you feed a hedgehog if you want to give them a supplement. Otherwise, they're very, very good um, at sniffing out food uh, for themselves, natural um, invertebrates for themselves. So hedgehogs also have a number of quite characteristic behaviours. All of these things, these bullets on the left-hand side probably form the, the bulk of the reason why everybody here has joined us today. You know, you'll know at least a couple of these things about hedgehogs and it's often what makes us fall in love with the hedgehog. So for begin, to begin with, they're nocturnal. So they're quite mysterious. We don't see them out and about during the day. Well, certainly we shouldn't see them out and about during the day um, because they're active at night. That's just how they've evolved to behave. Um, there are more uh, food resources available to them at night and they're also less likely to be sort of spotted by predators. Um, so it makes sense for them um, to, be, to be out at night. So yeah, it's very rare really that we as humans interact with them and when we do, it feels really special. Um, they're also quite solitary animals. 
Uh, so they don't really interact in, in sort of social groups. Many mammals do. Hedgehogs don't see the need. Um, so really, once they are um, independent from mum, they're sort of off on their own in the environment and they navigate their, their lives really independently from one another, except for um, very uh, sort of small um, points in the year. So there's an example at the top of the screen there, uh, and that's two male hedgehogs competing with each other over a food resource. So they have found a garden that's full of lots of cat food or, or dog food that's been left out for them. And um, they're competing over that resource. So that's one example. The mating season is another example where you, um, you're likely to see uh, more than one hedgehog at one time. Um, they are a hibernating species as well, so we're just, as I mentioned earlier, we're just at the tail end of hibernation now. Um, so hibernation is really a, a point in the, in the year where hedgehogs go into, a, it looks like a long sleep, you can see an image at the bottom of the screen there. They'll build a nest in which they, um, they go into a state of torpor for a number of months while the, the uh, environmental temperature is very low, natural food resources are, are not very abundant. They drop their core temperature down to match that of the environment. They slow their heart rate right down and their digestion, digestion right down so that they can survive that period of, um, of, of winter uh, in, in that torpor state. So yeah, we're coming to the end of that hibernation season now. You may even have already seen hedgehogs coming back into your gardens, parks or on campus. Um, more on that in a sec. Um, as I said earlier, they have no fight or flight response, which makes them quite an interesting species to study um, because they, they tend not to run away, really. If you see a hedgehog in your garden, um, it will freeze or it will curl into a ball, which means it gives you that opportunity to, to, to visually study them. Now, I'm not condoning picking up wild hedgehogs to look at them, but it does give you that opportunity to, um, to visually sort of observe. And it's just really interesting when you do get to see them because they're, they're really quite novel and they're quite characterful and very beautiful as well. <laughs> so hedgehogs are using our gardens, our parks, our campuses, any area of green space for lots of different reasons. Now one of the main threats that hedgehogs face is the threat of habitat loss which is a big um, a big problem for them being that they they now can't exhibit a lot of these behaviours where um, their habitats are being removed. So they're using these areas of green space for foraging, so they're foraging for natural food sources, they're also using these green spaces for nesting and resting in, so very vital behaviours that hedgehogs need to perform. Breeding, of course, and um, they'll be using, uh, you know, parks, campuses, our gardens for, um, for breeding. You may even have heard or seen it happen. Um, and also just simply for travelling through. Uh, so if you do see a hedgehog on your campus or in your garden, it may live nearby or it may simply just be travelling through. All of these behaviours are vital to a hedgehog. Um, and all of them uh, um, are, are, are just as important as one another, really. Um, just quickly, as I missed it, uh, just a little sound for you to hear the sound of, of hedgehogs competing with one another. It's quite a funny one, quite an interesting one. I hope you could hear that's a bit quiet and not the sound of the seagull because I'm sure you could hear the seagull in the background too but that sniffing sort of sniffing or snuffling sound and hedgehogs will, will make that sound at one another quite a forceful huffing sound when they're competing over a resource which could be food or it could be females and it's it's quite interesting to see and hear it's very loud you're, you're very likely to hear a hedgehog before you see one actually because they are quite loud so yeah some very interesting behaviors quick fun fact um, just to round up this slide, is that um, hedgehogs are the only species that I'm aware of performing um, this behaviour called self-anointing. So in reaction to certain strong smells, hedgehogs sometimes uh, cover, cover their back spines in a sort of frothy saliva. So it's quite an interesting thing to see. And if you saw it and, and you weren't aware of, of, um, of this behaviour being natural, you may think, oh, there's something wrong with that hedgehog. But actually, it's perfectly normal. And we don't actually know what this behaviour is for. We're not sure of the, the, the sort of um, the function of this behaviour. Um, so there's an interesting project for somebody if you're wanting to, to do a, a PhD later down the line. What is self-anointing all about? Um, there'll be questions probably on this, so um, let's uh, let's get through it. Yes, hedgehogs can breed with one another perfectly fine, although they are covered in spines. <laughs> so really, any time from next month onwards, we're likely to start seeing um, and possibly even hearing hedgehogs mating with one another. So they breed from mid-spring through to late summer. 
And here at the top of the screen um, is a, a lovely picture, I think, of uh, two hedgehogs mating with one another. So we have the male on the top and the female on the bottom. And this process um, can sometimes take hours. Um, the male will circle the female and huff and puff um, at her uh, and her back at him <laughs> until she decides yeah, he's worth mating with. And what will happen is she'll flatten the spines on the back of her body to allow him to, to, to mate with her. Um, I, I would hope relatively painlessly, but as I said, they do have fluff on their underbelly. So uh, you'd imagine it still hurts a little bit, but hey ho, it happens. Um, just a few short weeks later, the female gives birth to a litter of hoglets. So that's the word for baby hedgehogs, hoglets. So a very sweet word. And um, to four or five of these babies um, she gives birth to and she rears them completely independently. The, 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 the dad has nothing to do with it. So there is no paternal care in the hedgehog. Unfortunately, they don't stay in, in, in sort of breeding pairs. Um, I know we like to think of it as being the case, but it's, it's, it's not. But the mum's a super mum. And she can raise, you know, um, up to five of these uh, hoglets to independence. And she's got a really busy time of it because she's got so many hoglets to look after. And those hoglets are really vulnerable. And um, so the bottom left hand um, picture is a picture of a mum hedgehog with a baby hoglet in her mouth. What's going on there is her nest's probably been disturbed by gardening or possibly heavy rain. Um, and she's moving the babies from one nest to a safe, from a, an unsafe nest to a safer nest. And that's because they can't look after themselves. She has to do that for them. Um, and really until they're sort of six weeks old, um, they, they need quite a lot of constant round the clock care and looking after from mum. Um, you'll see an image on the right hand side at the bottom there of mum with a train of hoglets, train of little baby hedgehogs. So she's taking them out and teaching them how to forage for insects, how to build nests, how to generally be a hedgehog. And that happens at about three or four weeks. Um, you'll notice at the bottom there that those hedgehogs are out in the daytime. Um, uh, whereas the hedgehogs at the top are out at night, which is more common. And if you remember, I said it's not normal for hedgehogs to be out in the day. Well, actually those two examples at the bottom are an, an exception to that rule. So it is actually relatively common to, to see um, mum hedgehogs with babies out during the daytime. Um, unless there's some other reason why you're worried about them, um, you know, you can see an injury or they're wobbling or staggering, um, then just leave them to it. Um, because as I say, yes, it's, it's quite common to see those behaviours occur during the day. <laughs> and uh, just as an added cuteness, the hoglets, um, I don't have a sound to show you, um, but look it up after today. The hoglets make this really lovely chirping sound when they're quite young that can often sound like baby birds. So it's like a squeaking or peeping. Some people call it a chirping. Um, they're just lovely animals, lovely creatures, very lovely babies. All babies are gorgeous, aren't they? But I think hoglets are especially gorgeous. So here we are in the year, the year of the hedgehog. Um, we've just made it into spring. Guys, we made it, we did it. <laughs> and the hedgehogs made it too. Um, so they're in this point in the year where they're emerging from hibernation. Remember that long sort of sleep over the winter um, where they need to they need to um, uh, basically go, go into a torpor state to avoid the you know, really cold temperatures and lack of food. And then they've timed it really well to wake up in the spring when there's lots of food or a lot more food available for them. So they wake up from the hibernation and they're gonna be really hungry. They're gonna be really thirsty as well. So um, they'll be replenishing these fat reserves ready for um, a really busy period. So breeding period um, and courtship period. And um, so something really nice that you can do for hedgehogs right now um, actually is to make sure in your garden or campus or park or wherever it is that they have um, some extra food and water. So it might seem like a silly thing to suggest, um, but actually giving them a bit of a supplement um, alongside their natural foraging opportunities could help them um, to build up the fat that they really need um, over this really busy kind of main active period. So a little bit of cat food, a little bit of dog food wouldn't go amiss um, and just a shallow dish of fresh water. And um, so really any time from, as I said, next month, mid-April mid onwards, um, they'll be breeding um, and giving birth to babies. So it's a, a very busy period up through till September um, where mums are um, giving, building their breeding nests, giving birth to babies and rearing those babies, ready for them to enter their first hibernation in the coming um, winter. 
So it's a quite a busy period for hedgehogs, which means actually it puts them in this really vulnerable position um, where, um, where they can be either disturbed or they can be killed through um, activities that humans do. So one of the key things there um, is when we strim or mow our grass, uh, because hedgehogs can actually rest in longer grass, it puts them at a really vulnerable position to, to being killed. Um, and that does happen, unfortunately, quite often. In the breeding period, the very sort of middle of the breeding period, any time um, sort of from, um, from, from the end of May, you know, mid-May through to um, the end of September, early October, the breeding nests, so mum with her babies inside their nest, um, are also really uh, vulnerable to disturbance. So there's loads of different types of disturbance that could um, be a problem for those breeding nests, whether it's um, strimming or mowing, uh, whether it's just doing a bit of, you know, sort of garden tidying, dealing with that corner of bramble that you've been meaning to get to, um, or, uh, you know, taking down an old garden shed, um, because hedgehogs can and often often do build their nests in these spaces. So we are sharing our, our gardens and our parks and our campus with wild animals like the hedgehog. And unfortunately, it, you know, if, if, if you're not thinking about them, um, if they're not in the forefront of your mind when you're out there doing your gardening, it's very likely that you could end up disturbing a nest, which has quite nasty consequences. So she may end up abandoning the babies. In some strange cases, she may eat them, depending on how old they are. So try not to disturb a hedgehog's nest if you can avoid it. We don't want mums eating babies. Um, November time. Uh, is also really sort of key hazard for hedgehogs and that's because of really um, of bonfire night. Hedgehogs can nest or rest in log piles and really um, a bonfire before it's lit is a is a fantastic kind of um, hedgehog house really kind of it, you know it's there's lots of bugs there it provides them with a, a structure to build their nest in so frequently at, at bonfire night they are um, subject to being burned alive in bonfires so that's not a very now specific example but just shows you that unfortunately um, the way that hedgehogs live and and, and act in, in the spaces that we share with them, it puts them in, in some quite vulnerable situations. So, um, so that's sad, isn't it? But um, you may be wondering, are there any ways for me to figure out whether there are hedgehogs in my garden or hedgehogs nearby? And yeah, actually there's loads of ways to do that. I save actually seeing one, you know, going out at night and looking for them or, or, or listening for them. Um, you can look for field signs. So signs that hedgehogs or wild animals leave behind. Um, so that you can tell whether they've whether they've been there and um, without having to spend the night out uh, outdoors searching for them. So one example of this is is footprints. You can be on the lookout for footprints. So when we had some quite heavy snow just gone, I was out there every every morning looking for for prints, looking for um, you know rabbit prints, badger prints, fox prints, hedgehog prints. Um, so snow is a good example of somewhere you can be looking for prints. Also mud, you can be looking for prints in the mud, or you can do a purpose made um, small mammal footprint survey which is something I think York St John is interested in doing in the future which um, there's a bit more information about this to come um, but if you look on the left of the screen there you can see these kind of black tunnels uh, and some footprints to the side of them so really simple structures um, just made of a bit of sort of corrugated plastic and with a non-toxic ink inside um, and a little bit of food used as a bait so that they're not um, a destructive trap it doesn't cause any harm to the animal simply just gives them a bit of food and a, a sort of mucky paw as they leave the other end of the tunnel they leave these lovely footprints behind as you can see on the screen there that look a little bit like kids handprints um, so that's the kind of print you're looking for they're very small only about two or three centimeters long you can also be on the lookout for poo. There's an image of the poo down at the bottom there. I won't spend too much time talking about that, but they're full of shiny bits of beetle shell, which makes them quite characteristic, only small, maybe about the sort of half the size of your little finger. You can also be on the lookout for spines as well. So hedgehog spines, uh, they do um, drop off every now and again, just like our hairs do. So if you're very lucky, you might see one of those in your garden. They're about two or three centimetres long. They've got one very sharp end and, and then one sort of bulbous end. And that's the bit that sits in the skin. Let us know if you've ever seen one of those. If you've got a wildlife camera. Oh, it's not going to let me play it. 
Um, if you've got a wildlife camera, uh, pop that out in your garden or on your campus now, see what footage you can get as hedgehogs start to emerge. Uh, this was just a short clip of a hedgehog visiting um, a sort of feeding station. You can also be on the lookout for hedgehog nests as well. So hedgehog nests tend to be built um, underneath structures like log piles or bramble patches and they're made out of leaves and so you can see that example on the right hand side there uh, and you can see how it how it may be um, how it may be that they their nests get disturbed quite often because you know to the untrained eye that does just look like a pile of leaves um, but yeah there's hedgehogs in the middle there so lots of field signs and um, this fantastic website I would certainly encourage you to go and have a look at now, um, if not immediately after this webinar, um, is the uh, Big Hedgehog Map. So bighedgehogmap.org is a citizen science map available to anybody who's interested, where you can log sightings of hedgehogs in your area, and you can go on to see whether hedgehogs have been spotted um, where you live. So when I first moved into my new house, got straight on this map to see whether there'd been any hedgehogs logged in the area. Um, so it's a really useful resource for citizen uh, science. It's a really useful resource for, for this project, particularly if you've seen hedgehogs on or around your university campus. So just a quick screenshot on the screen of your university campus. And if you can see those small pink dots dotted around York and um, adjacent to your campus, hedgehogs have been spotted in the area before, would you believe? Um, so if you've seen a hedgehog on your campus, please go on and log it. You can log it under the hedgehog friendly campus key and it would really, really help your hedgehog team to decide um, what actions they're going to apply on campus going forwards. Um, so please go on and log your hogs. It's a fantastic website just to play with anyway. So it's bighedgehogmap.org. So remember, hedgehogs are now vulnerable to extinction. Um, I'm just going to go through some of the reasons why. Um, so unfortunately for hedgehogs, as I said earlier, the, the reasons why they're vulnerable to extinction are, are numerous and um, kind of they're interweaving as well. Um, and I think without exclusion, um, in, certainly on, on, on this list here, um, it's not really, a, it's very difficult to untangle the threats that hedgehogs face from the presence of humans, um, which is sad. Uh, but you can see on here, just some sort of graphical representations of the threats they face. We'll start with the top left. Um, hedgehogs can swim. Um, which is a surprise um, to a lot of people, I think, because they're so small. Um, the problem comes with hedgehogs when um, they enter a water source, be it a pond or a lake, um, but can't get back out again. Uh, so you may have um, seen sort of pond ramps or, or similar sorts of structures that lots of people have started putting in their, in their ponds, which is fantastic. And this was really a response to lots of hedgehogs being found dead, drowned in, in ponds. So although they can swim, they can't swim forever. Um, and they need some kind of an exit route or an escape route from ponds. Um, which way shall I go? Let's go down one. Um, so the threat of, of roads is a really big one. Um, so roads here, you know, in, in, in the UK are, um, you know, they're ever growing and the number of cars using those roads are, are, are ever growing as well. And these roads really are causing a fracturing of, of natural habitat for hedgehogs. So where used to be pristine green space, um, you know, there's now a, a, a whacking great big road running through it. And unfortunately for hedgehogs, they can and do roam very far and wide. So up to two two kilometres a night um, and unfortunately that means that they they may have to cross busy roads you know they're wild animals they don't know it's a road they don't know that cars are using it um, so this is a very common sight and in fact I would bet my bottom dollar that most of you that have joined us today who've seen a hedgehog within the last few years have seen have seen it dead on the side of the road it's a very common sight here unfortunately, and lots of studies being done um, into this and the ways that we may be able to, to limit that, that threat to hedgehogs, that's looking very significant. So if you remember, there's about less than a million hedgehogs left in the UK, rough estimate, um, up to 335,000 hedgehogs are killed on the roads every year. So that's a really huge, significant chunk um, of, of the, the population that's that's simply just being obliterated on the roads. And it's not limited just to hedgehogs. Roads are a big problem for all mammals, all, all wildlife, really. Um, so, yeah, that's that's a, a big threat really here, here in the UK. There's a, 
a couple of kind of innocuous looking images that you might be wondering why they're on there. The image just immediately underneath that poor dead hedgehog on the road sort of signifies um, suburbia or development, you know, um, again, where used to be pristine woodland or grassland or, you know, lovely um, habitat for hedgehogs to forage or nest in, it's being built upon. Um, this is a, an example of um, a new build house that's, uh, you know, it's got a giant driveway out of the front that's maybe two or three times the size of the house. Used to be green space and is now, you know, absolutely useless to, to wildlife, to, to all wildlife. Um, so we're sort of moving with development, we're moving to this kind of way of, of, of building that, that doesn't take wildlife into account, doesn't take nature into account, which is, is one of the, the big problems. But habitat loss um, isn't just a problem in urban and suburban areas, it's also a big problem in rural areas. So that's why the tractor at the top there, we're getting rid of field margins, we're getting rid of hedgerows, we're getting rid of tree lines, we're cutting back grass left, right and centre, really because we have a, a big population of people that we need to feed. So we're preferencing growing food over uh, over over wildlife so more and more we're seeing hedgehogs moving out of rural areas and, and into urban areas where they don't face such um such massive uh, threats from habitat loss as um as you can see in in the top top of the screen there um litter in urban areas in some, really anywhere you look in the uk litter is a problem and it's a problem for all wildlife but particularly for hedgehogs as you can see on this image just in the center of the screen because of the way that their spines work so um, if they get trapped in a piece of litter it's impossible for them to make to, to get themselves free really and um, so their spines run one way but they don't run the other way so that piece of litter is trapped on that hedgehog until it's rescued and this is one of the lucky ones that's been found unfortunately hedgehogs are often found dead on you know the side of the road because they've gotten their heads trapped in coffee cups or crisp packets and they can't shake themselves loose and um, so litter is a big problem we talked about bonfires already. I'm not going to hammer that point home too much because I think it's probably one of the best known threats to hedgehogs. But bonfires are a big problem. Another innocuous looking image, which is the, the image in the middle to the, um, the right hand side of the hedgehog trapped in that piece of litter. Um, walls and fences, particularly in urban areas and, and, and suburban areas, villages and, and towns, walls and fences present um, a, another big problem for hedgehogs who you know, they can't fly, they're not able to, to make their way over these barriers unless there's a, you know, a, a sort of narrow gap towards the bottom of a fence or wall, which in new builds doesn't happen all that often. So what's happening there is, you know, on, on the other side of that, that fence that you can see in the image could be the most hedgehog friendly garden or park, you know, with lots and lots of um, wild areas and areas of bramble for them to nest in and a lovely hedgehog house and maybe even some hedgehog food. But if they've got no access in, then there's absolutely no, you know, there's no point. Um, so fences, walls, any kind of area that's, you know, obstructing hedgehogs from moving around. Remember, they've got to move, you know, upwards of maybe two kilometres a night. That's causing a big problem as well. Um, poison's possibly another one of the, 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 the threats that we're very aware of. But from rat poison to pesticides to herbicides are all causing a big problem for, for hedgehogs. They're either directly causing mortality, hedgehogs are ingesting these poisons, or they're indirectly causing mortality by um, really reducing the natural uh, food sources that hedgehogs have available. You know, that's the point of pesticides is to get rid of things like um, you know slugs or uh, or beetles but those are a really important source of food for hedgehogs even earthworms that perhaps we don't realize these pesticides have a really big impact on um which is causing a lot a lot of sort of more um more complicated problems down the line um for for hedgehogs and other animals that compete with those uh, hedgehogs um dogs Foxes and badgers are really the only predators for, for hedgehogs um, at all. So dogs and foxes, it's very low level predation. Um, they will pick off the, the really sick ones, the really weak ones or the very small ones. Badgers, um, particularly this is the case in rural areas. Um, 
they uh, they will eat hedgehogs if there's no other natural food source available. And as I said earlier, they um, there are a number of animals that hedgehogs share um, food sources with, and uh, badgers are one of the kind of primary ones. So they they share um, you know earthworms and beetles as a food source. And if there's an area of land where there's not very many of those beetles or earthworms available unfortunately and this is the way um uh, the way of life the badger will turn on the hedgehog and predate the hedgehog and um, it does happen um but it's not the sole reason for the decline in hedgehogs just in case anybody was going to ask that question and um, we're not victimizing badgers here <laughs> uh so there are areas in the uk around sort of um norfolk where Badgers aren't aren't quite as as um, as populous, where hedgehogs are still declining just as fast as the rest of the UK. So, while badgers are a, a predator for hedgehogs, they're not the sole reason for their decline. So it's quite complicated, as I think you'll appreciate from that slide. There are a lot of threats hedgehogs face, and the answer um, to um, to what you know, what do we do for hedgehogs? It just isn't. It's not as simple as I wish it was. And um, you know, how can we turn their numbers around? What I will say is, um, and this is a not so fun fact. You've had some fun facts, but this is the not so fun fact. The two kind of primary threats to hedgehogs across the UK are habitat loss and and roads, really. Um, so you may feel like you have very little influence over those two threats, over those two things. But actually, there are quite a lot of things we can all do to limit the, these threats and to limit this problem. So some solutions for you after a, a sad and maddening slide. Um, and yes, thankfully there are some, there's lots of projects out there to promote these kinds of things that you can do for hedgehogs. And you might notice that some of these things that you can do for hedgehogs are some of the things that you can do for all wildlife. So lots and lots of wildlife trusts and nature charities and um, projects are saying, try and create habitat um, and the way that you can try and create habitat for hedgehogs you know even if it's a micro habitat in your own garden it's just to be a bit more messy um so messy is best when it comes to hedgehogs hedgehogs really like things like wildflowers and um, log piles brambles are crucial if hedgehogs are going to build their um hibernation nests they need things like brambles which you know we as gardeners kind of see as pests um, if you've got a lovely bramble patch in your garden and there's hedgehogs nearby, they'll flock to it. Um, leaves or leaf piles, you know, we're all too, um, all too quick to tidy these things up and, and chuck them in the compost or chuck them over the, the side of, of the wall. But actually leaf litter is really important for hedgehogs to build their nests with. And things like areas of longer grass. So having, you know, um, a little patch in your garden that you just let the grass grow long and let all the wildflowers come through. That's an area where hedgehogs can rest during the summer. So all of those things you might consider as a bit messy, but if a hedgehog was to wander past, they would they would think, blimey, it's been made, purpose made for me. And so all of those amazing, simple things you can do for hedgehogs um, to give them a bit of habitat just in your own patch. And, you know, think about that on campus as well. Um, so all, all of those types of habitat are fantastic to be encouraging. If you're doing any mowing or strimming or gardening, um, just be very careful um, you, and be aware that you might accidentally disturb a hedgehog nest. If you're doing mowing or strimming, um, it may even be that, you know, you're causing a physical injury or, 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 or death. Um, so the best thing you can do if you're doing any mowing or strimming is just to, you know, it sounds silly, but just check, just look to see if there's anything there. I did it on the front of my garden last year and I was so glad I did because there was a couple of frogs. So I was just going through and, and sort of using my foot um, just to make sure that there was nothing in there and a couple of frogs jumped away, which I'm glad they did because I'd have gotten with them over otherwise. Um, so just, just taking those simple steps for wildlife, you know, it's just a case of taking a beat, having a think and having a quick look. Um, Creating areas of, of kind of access for hedgehogs is really important too. So we showed you that image of, of a, a wall or fence and you may think, you know, that's not a big problem. But if, if hedgehogs don't have access into areas of green space, you know, your garden or parks or whatever, you know, it's, it's of, of no benefit to them. So hedgehog highways is one solution to that. And it's a term you may have heard of. Hedgehog highways are really small, sort of, what would you say, about the size of a cd case 
Um, so just small holes in the bottom of fences or walls, um, or perhaps a channel that you, you dig underneath your fence, you know, in the dirt, so that hedgehogs can come and go. It's as simple as that. Um, and green corridors are, um, are an alternative to that. So making um, lots and lots of uh, tree lines or hedge lines um, and just trying to bring back these kind of permeable boundaries that hedgehogs can move in and through and talk to your neighbours about it too you know it's it's a this is a community uh, it should be a community-wide thing we should all know the ways that we can help hedgehogs and the big impact it can have if you don't have a hedgehog highway in your um your fence um your fence or wall and you're interested in creating one please do and record it because so many times people have said I installed a hedgehog highway and that night a hedgehog turned up in my garden have you know having never had hedgehogs in their garden before it is just so common and so that they're, they're really really well used and it's just one of the the best things that you can do for hedgehogs and um, and wildlife we talked about offering kind of like a, a supplementary food um, so you can do that if you want to and it's something really lovely that you can do it doesn't just help hedgehogs but you may be feeding badgers and foxes and all sorts possibly lots of neighborhood cats too but hey ho um, meaty cat food or dog food it doesn't matter if it's wet or dry is the perfect supplement for a hedgehog particularly at this time of year and make sure that you're also offering fresh water as well so just a shallow dish of fresh water and it could be a life it could be a lifesaver for them if you've got a pond and um, so in your garden or if you're thinking about campus which I hope, I hope you're also thinking about campus at the same time escape ramps are really important so great if you've got water sources we would never discourage those just make sure that there are safe exits for them and I think there'll be an opportunity a little bit later down the line for staff and students to get involved in in some kind of um safe waterways uh, campaign at York St John's so bear that in mind um, there's lots of surveys going on out there at the moment, community surveys, UK wide surveys um, to find out more about hedgehogs. The big hedgehog map that I showed you earlier is one example, which just builds a nice big picture of where hedgehogs are likely to be in the UK. But check out other surveys as well. There's the Living with um, Mammals survey and the Mammals on Road surveys that happen every year. Um, and really all, all they require is you to just log on to a website and say that you've seen something out and about on your travels. And they're really important, these citizen science surveys, um, and they've helped us to build up a, a really good understanding of how hedgehogs use our urban spaces. Um, and just lastly, and perhaps a bit more obviously, um, cut out your chemicals where you can. Uh, so slug poisons, weed killer, pesticides, insecticides, rat poisons are all bad. They're all poison at the end of the day poison in the environment is never really a good thing all of these um, poisons and chemicals will impact on hedgehogs whether that's directly or indirectly um, and uh, moving to more organic methods is again uh, one of the best things that you can do for wildlife so lots of solutions there um, if you want to learn a bit more or have something physical you can have a flick through the British Hedgehog Preservation Society do have lots of leaflets and information available so there's the gardening with hedgehog series and the creating a wildlife garden series um, that you can uh, have a flick through online or request in physical form something you can do to help hedgehogs right now and you may even be the person to sign this this petition that pushes it right over the edge we are um, asking for signatures from staff and students and really anybody that cares um, to, uh, to ask the government to give hedgehogs a little bit more protection here in the UK. Um, so what we're asking of the government is for them to discuss moving hedgehogs um, to Schedule 5 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act, which will mean that they have the kinds of protections that um, bats and badgers do, uh, and hopefully it will go um, some way to protecting the habitats um, that they use and require. So remember, habitat loss is one of the bigger threats that they face, so we're asking the government to consider that. You could be, as I said, the person to push this petition over the edge, so please do go and sign it. I'll pop the link into the chat if there is one. I think there's a chat box, isn't there? I'll pop the, the link in there in just a sec. Um, so remember the current laws um, or the current protections that hedgehogs face they are really only protecting against those minor threats and they ignore what the major overarching issues and reasons for hedgehog that this rate of hedgehog decline are. So signing this petition, getting the government to have a think about it a bit more um, is, is, um, is really, really important. So we've been really pushing this. So thanks if you've already signed it and we'll pop the 
link in in a sec for you to give it a sign. Just really quickly, um, so I think it might be useful for you to know how to spot the signs of a hedgehog in need of help. I told you there'd be loads of info in this, so you've probably all got a headache now. Um, but there's a couple of really um, simple ways for you to recognise if a hedgehog needs some help. So if you're having a walk on campus or if you're walking through your local park or, or wherever and you see hedgehogs that are lethargic, so if they look lethargic, then they're probably kind of, um, you know, just sort of sitting there or, or, or lying there and they're not moving and they look kind of dopey or they're out in the daytime and sunbathing. That's a hedgehog that needs some help. That's not normal for a hedgehog. Remember, again, um, yeah, they are nocturnal and they're very active animals, so they're not, they don't really do that naturally. If they're covered in flies, um, that could indicate that they've got some kind of an injury um, that's become infected. So look out for hedgehogs that are covered in flies. Wobbly hedgehogs. So it might sound strange, but hedgehogs, they don't wobble as they walk. Um, if they wobble and they kind of look a bit drunk, then that could indicate that there's some kind of parasite problem. And that's not something you can help with. You need to get it straight to a rescue centre as soon as possible. So wobbly hedgehogs. Obvious injuries, so, you know, limbs that are missing or if they're dragging limbs, you know, if they're bleeding, that kind of thing. If you've seen a hedgehog that's been trapped in something, maybe caught in netting, sports netting or down a drain or something like that, that's a hedgehog that needs some help. And hoglets, actually. So if you remember hoglets, the word for baby hedgehog, really from sort of next month onwards, um, you can be listening out for that squawking sound because baby hoglets that may have been abandoned or orphaned and um, because they're so vulnerable at that age they they can they can often need to be taken in to a rescue center and the way that you can tell whether they're hoglets that need to be rescued is if you see them out in the day without an adult or if you hear that squawking sound so they they should be with with them with their mum all the time and if they're making that squawking sound it means they're desperately hungry so um, they may need a bit of help and of course out during the day so um, there are some exceptions to that and I showed you a couple of those exceptions earlier so um, if a hedgehog's out in the daytime um, usually it means it's poorly but just ask yourself this question is the hedgehog moving with purpose so is it performing a task or a function and um, so for instance building it, its, its nest um, material or uh, it's you know taking its hoglets out on, on, a, on a training session if, if that's the case then that's fine otherwise it may be a, a hedgehog that needs some help what do you need to do you just need to get in touch with your local rescue centre and there's loads of them um, hundreds of them actually, to find out where your local hedgehog rescue centre is, give the British Hedgehog Preservation Society a quick call. Um, and that's 01584 890 801. And they've got a list of all the hedgehog rescue centres around. Um, so um, I don't know if now maybe might be the time, you know, if you want to unmute, but I think there might be some opportunities for you, staff and students, to get involved in the campaign on campus. So really up until now we've been talking about ways that you as an individual can help but you also as you know as a staff member or student at your university can get involved too so as far as i'm aware and um, there's lots of opportunities going on at the moment for you to get involved whether that's managing social media pages or producing and writing blogs to inform mm -hmm. people about how you can help hedgehogs and um, whether that's getting involved in hedgehog surveys and um, or doing pond audits and making improvements to ponds on campus or even getting involved in your own sort of hedgehog campaign so whether you're interested in um, you know campaigning about slowing slowing for hedgehogs in an area where they're likely to get killed or you're interested in campaigning against litter or you're interested in cam campaigning for hedgehog highways there's lots of campaigns you can do and we can certainly help you with that. So any students or even staff who are interested, we do a dedicated campaigns workshop. Um, so perhaps if, if you are interested in, in learning a bit more about how you can run your own campaign and perhaps get in touch with the, the York St. John Hedgehog Friendly Campus team and we can sort that out for you. I think there's also space on the working group for anybody that wants to get yes. involved on the ground level. Is that right, you know? Yes. Yeah. So um, if you want to Definitely. get involved in making changes to your university campus for hedgehogs and um, drop us an email and we'll put you in touch with the team i think that's possibly the best way of doing it any comments on that <laughs> uh, any comments on that you mean does that all no um yeah no that's that all sounds great i mean um we haven't been able to do this much this year due to covid but um we're hoping to get it up and running again and yeah we're hoping to do um as joe mentioned surveys and um Yes, um, other 
exciting actions for hedgehogs. So yes, if you're interested, do get in touch um, either through our Twitter at YSJ Hedgehog or you can email us, um, get in touch. Yes. Fantastic. Lovely. So loads of opportunities there and you'll be helping for, um, your university to achieve silver award, your silver award, which is great. So thank you all so much for tuning in and listening. And hopefully you've got bags of ideas, um, for things you're going to go and do to help hedgehogs now. Um, give us a follow at Hog Friendly if you want to find out what's going on across the rest of the UK. Thank you so much, you know, for um, organising today and for having me, um, uh, everybody for joining. And lastly, to the British Hedgehog Preservation Society for the funding for the project. So I'm um, happy to take questions. Yes, so um, if anyone's got questions, um, happy for you to pop them in the Q&A um, box below. Uh, has anyone got any questions that they want to ask Joe? Um, I was going to ask one where, um, what has been, I know you work with quite a lot of universities for this um, campaign, and um, what has been, can you tell us anything that um, that was memorable whilst you're doing the campaign? Anything that um, would be interesting to share? Yeah, so oh, I've, there's loads of anecdotes and stories and lovely, lovely um ways that people have gotten engaged and, and and tried to learn a little bit more. The one that really sticks out in my head is, is kind of a, it's a mixture of a sad and a, and a happy story actually. And it comes from the University of Birmingham. And it's one of the reasons why it's so important for people to, to kind of understand hedgehogs a little bit more. Um, so the Birmingham University is, is, is um, it's quite a sprawling campus. And they're doing a lot of development on the, on the campus at the moment. Um, and just last year, the height of, in fact, no, it was the previous year, in the height of summer, um, a little bit of development um, happening and a new build um, was going on. A staff member walked past and heard the sound of um, sort of baby birds tweeting or ch chirping, but really quite low down on the ground. And um, so they had a little look and found that it was two hoglets. Um, it was actually two baby hedgehogs that had been... Um, well, mum, mum wasn't there. And two of the of the nest had made their way, sort of squirmed their way out of the nest and onto onto the kind of border of grass. Um, so they were a bit more obvious. They collected these hoglets up and took them took them straight to a, um, a hedgehog rescue centre. And the rescue centre said to them, "Were these the only two, or or were there more?" And she thought, "Oh gosh, I didn't check to see if there were more." So she actually went back to where these hoglets had been found and found two more of them in the nest. Um, so it's really important if you ever do come across hoglets that have been abandoned or orphaned that you're you're checking really thoroughly to see if um, if there are other hoglets nearby that also need rescuing. Just as an aside, it's a little sad. And um, what had happened to the mum is that she'd been run over on campus only about sort of a few hundred meters away from the nest, um, which was really really sad for the for the team and for the university. But actually. As a consequence of that, they were able to install some hedgehog crossing signs so that staff and students that drove around on campus were aware that hedgehogs were using the area. And just to um, put your mind at ease, the hedgehogs were rehabilitated and then they were released um, in a safe area of campus a little bit later on. So lots of really lovely work going on. And I think the key is just to make sure that you're aware of what the main issues are and how you can help. Yes, no, that's very interesting. And it, it proves that you never know what's, what's out there when you, when you look out for them. Yeah, exactly. It's always a surprise, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, we've got three more questions, um, and I think um, we'll bring the, we'll bring the uh, webinar to a finish. Um, so the first question um, is: um, This person says, um, "I have a dog. Um, so sort of, would it be dangerous for the hedgehogs if I built a highway in the garden?" Um, so, I mean, I suppose it depends on the temperament of the dog. Um, so, uh, you know, if you've got a dog that's very likely to, to attack um, and, and kill a hedgehog, then uh, maybe it's dangerous. You've got to balance that, haven't you? Um, if your dog were to attack a hedgehog, it probably would learn its lesson very quickly. Um, you know, they, dogs only kind of kill the smaller or very sick um, hedgehogs. Uh, equally, um, if you don't let your your dog out into your garden and um, off the leaves, then it's not really a problem. And um, if you're letting your um, 
dog out into your garden at night time off the lead then that could be a problem because that's when hedgehogs are active so they're out of their nest and they're, they're moving around um, so it really depends on the, the kind of um, the kind of dog that you have um, one of the solutions that, that I've heard people use which is quite nice is if you do have a dog that you let out off the lead at night just flick um, flick the light on um, you know a light that's near near to your garden just before you let your dog out maybe five or ten minutes before because the light should um, deter the hedgehog and it should go back into the borders where it's nice and safe but um, I wouldn't let it put you off building a hedgehog highway and just monitor the situation um, because as I say it can be one of the best things that you do for hedgehogs is to give them that access and just keep an eye on your dog um, if you are worried. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've got the next question, uh, which is um, environmental dangers aside, what is the expected lifespan of a hedgehog? The expected lifespan. Um, so the, the sort of average is around two or three years in the wild, um, but hedgehogs can live up to uh, seven years. I think the record is 10 in the wild um, that, that I'm aware of. Um, so uh, seven is, 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 is what you would expect um, for, a, for a hedgehog that, that doesn't face the kind of environmental dangers um, uh, that, that they do, you know, ubiquitously across the UK. <laughs> in the, um, if they're in captivity, they can live a little bit longer than that. I see. That's um, a lot longer than I thought it was. Um, so, yeah, no, that's an interesting fact that I learned today. Yeah. Thank you. OK. And so we're coming on to our last question, uh, which is uh, we like to leave some extra food out for the hedgehogs um, in, out in the back garden. But we are surrounded by neighbours with cats. Um, do you have any suggestions about how we can leave food out for hedgehogs without encouraging all the neighbourhood cats to uh, to their garden? Good question. Um, yeah. Uh, so there are specific hedgehog foods that you can buy. Um, now, be careful if you're looking up hedgehog food online or in your uh, local shop, because some of them are not fit for purpose. Um, the only two that we would recommend are Spike's hedgehog food or Bramble's hedgehog food. And they're, they're purpose made for hedgehogs. Um, so they cats will still eat them, but they're just not as fussed as if you're putting out cat food. So that's one solution, buy Spike's or Bramble's food. Another really good solution is to get a hedgehog feeding station. Um, so it's really just an upturned storage box with a hole cut in and it stops cats from going in. That's great. Um, yeah, that's, um, yeah, definitely something to, to um, make note of, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I think um, that's all the questions we have for today. Um, so we're going to bring this webinar to a close. Um, just want to thank Joe again for joining us today. Thank you very much for your time and interesting webinar. Um, yes, it's, um, I'm sure um, it's giving out lots of information to, to people who's joined, so that's great. Um, I also also thank to want to thank um, all the people who organize Green Week, um, the Students' Union, all the student volunteers, um, all the staff at York St. Joe University who was involved. Um, so yes, if you like to um, attend um, the or other events um, during Green Week, please do look up our events website, webpage um, for the events. Um, we love to have you there. Also, in terms of Twitter, um, follow us on um, YSJ Ecological Justice um, at YSJ Sustain. And also, if you're interested in finding more about hedgehogs and what we do, um, please follow us on at um, YSJ Hedgehog. Where we'll be sending out information um, for future campaigns as well. Okay, thank you again, everyone. Um, okay, thank you. <laughs>